Uh, as Stephen just said, my name is Paul McKay. Um, I'm a CISSP uh, through ISC Squared, uh, and I've been asked to come along and give uh, the BSC and the IISP a talk this evening. Um, I think the topic was pretty much left to my own choice, um, so I've chosen Web 2.0 applications, mainly because Bob and Pierce, which is where I work, are actually trying to implement a policy around the use of Web 2.0. So, tonight we're going to cover an introduction about myself, some Web 2.0 sites, social networking in general, blogs, how Web 2.0 is used in the business, known hacks and vulnerabilities, successes, gaffes, Google, which is quite a, an interesting one, and a summary and conclusion. So, about me, as I say, I'm CISSP, I've been at Bond Pierce for 12 years working in the IT department, I specialised, or started to specialise in information security about 6-7 years ago. Uh, I'm responsible for information security at Bond Pierce, uh, as well as many other things. So, what are Web 2.0 sites? They're sites that allow users to interact with each other, and collaborate with each other in a social media dialogue. So what does that exactly mean? That means that you can pose questions and react and answer to questions. You can update documents. You can collaborate on documents. And you can also do marketing, which is where our business development team are trying to use Web 2.0. They allow users to do more than just retrieve inf information by increasing what is already possible within Web 1.0. So the internet as we would like to think of it already existing. It's much enhanced, much richer user interface, a software storage facilities, and all through their web browser. So it's all thin client stuff. So examples, well-known examples of Web 2.0 sites. We've got Facebook, used by millions worldwide. I can't actually remember what the, the latest figures are for Facebook, but it's a ridiculous number of people. Twitter, sorry? 800 million. There you go. I'm sure they're all friends of each other by uh, six degrees of separation as well. Twitter, used by millions worldwide. Obviously some famous people in there. Stephen Fry is an example. Probably one of the, the more followed people on Twitter. LinkedIn, aimed at professionals. And blog sites. So Facebook. So you've actually got 500 million. It's obviously gone up in the last couple of weeks. That's worldwide user accounts based on Facebook. Allow users to share pictures and thoughts by status updates. Allow users to message one another, and there's also a little instant chat, instant messaging facility now in Facebook. Allows applications and games, which are obviously deemed to be the bad side of, of Facebook where businesses are concerned. And privacy controls have massively improved. Not everyone makes use of those privacy settings though. Twitter, class as microblogging, I think you're limited to 140 characters per tweet. Allow users to follow other people or topics. Um, so as an example, I follow a guy called Dr. DNS. He's actually called Thomas Lee, he's an American, uh, and he actually specializes in PowerShell. Um, so if you, you know, follow him, you get loads of code and different little blog, you know, blogs about various things. It's a useful source of information and can answer an issue. Thomas is one of these people that will actually give uh, a, a classroom on, on PowerShell and part of that week-long course he'll sit there and using Twitter he'll ask a question along the lines of what is the best WMI class to interrogate the operating system and sure enough within a couple of minutes somebody that follows Thomas has replied with use this WMI class. However, Twitter is flooded with useless comments 1% of the people account for 99% of the activity. And Twitter obviously relies on you following a person or topic. LinkedIn, primarily used by professionals, aids with CRM, so client relationship management, and networking within industry. It's a good source for meeting new people, contacts, and therefore business opportunities. 
Ron Pierce is an example. We're very much keen on allowing all of our lawyers to be able to use LinkedIn for that networking and social interaction with other law firms, other businesses whereby we might win business from them, simply by being out there, being seen to be out there, being approachable. Many businesses now encourage the use of LinkedIn for maintaining client and customer links. We quite often within the IT department at Bon Pierce get asked to allow access to Facebook, to Twitter, to LinkedIn, to different other social network sites, to YouTube. And it's also easier for targeted abuse by recruiters. We've actually got a, an instance where there's a recruiter in the southwest who's basically been ripping off all of the jobs that we've been posting ourselves, putting them on his own website, inflating the salary by a factor of about 10, and badgering our recruitment team to make him the, the prime recruiter for Bon Pierce. Needless to say, he hasn't got very far. Blogs, some of them can be excellent. However, there are also some dodgy ones out there. Don't read very well. Topic matter isn't very good. And certainly you can dis disclose too much information. So obviously a business is responsible for the upkeep of its own integrity and security. And some blog sites do indeed release and disclose too much information about an individual or a business. Certainly stuff that you wouldn't put onto a business website. However, blogs rely on people actually going to that blog site and reading the blog. If it's too long, certainly myself. If it's pages and pages and pages, I'm certainly not going to sit there and read it. So, how is Web 2.0, social networking, social media, used within the business? It certainly has reinvented marketing. And you'll see, as an example in a second, how that's uh, been the case for one particular company. You have the ability to reach out to a wider audience in a very short time period. No longer are you doing flyer mail shots, which obviously take a day or two to get somewhere. You're no longer sending out bulk emails. You're basically doing one update to your website, to your social networking feed, to your Twitter feed. And everybody that's following you and everybody that wants to, that information is going to get that information almost instantly. And it allows interaction and feedback. So marketing departments and business development departments are actually able, from the feedback that they get from putting out a status update or by putting out something into a social media environment, if they get negative feedback, they can very quickly change that and adapt that. Real-time responses to a campaign allows for adjustment if needed. More cost-effective marketing and PR. Again, you're no longer spending hundreds, thousands of pounds on flyers, on branding of, of information, printing costs, etc. It's all there available on the internet. Encourages organisations to listen, not just talk. So improving the service and customer relations. So going back to that feedback, if we put out something onto the internet, and we get a negative response, we can very quickly adapt to that and hopefully repair any damage that's already been caused. However, there are threats with using Web 2.0 on social media. More dynamic content online, so there's no ex expectations about what you see. It, as I say, because of feedback, because of changes, what you've read 10 minutes ago might no longer be current. The company might have already updated it, they might have changed it. Price of something that they're offering at uh, a lower cost suddenly might have gone up. Content builds from multiple sources. Okay, so by that, it actually has the ability to pull information from various different sources. Again, if you start doing that with your Web 2.0 feeds, you're very much reliant on your source being correct, up-to-date, accurate, and able to be disclosed. Users implicitly trust content, so Facebook, LinkedIn. Should you trust the content that you read on the internet? It's a bit like what you read in the newspaper. Yeah, some of it could, should and could be taken with a pinch of salt. 
sites send consent emails with little content to the user. So you must follow a link to learn the information. So you might just get a link to Google's privacy. Google's privacy pages are pages and pages and pages, and you'll see in a second why parts of it are actually worth a read, especially if you're having problems sleeping at night. So known hacks and vulnerabilities. So looking at the three or four that I've already touched on. So Facebook, there was obviously quite well-known uh, coup phase virus, uh, supposedly Facebook backwards. Obviously book is backwards, but face isn't. Hoax apps, getting you to click on an app to install a Trojan or a worm, which then allows you to disclose of information on your machine, whether it be your bank details, email addresses, etc. Money transfers, there was quite a big scandal with Facebook about 12 months or so ago with money laundering, etc. Fake ads, fake ads down the right hand side of Facebook, these are actually targeted ads as well based on your cookies. So if you continually go to a particular style or type of, of website, they're the type of ads that you're going to start seeing down the side of your Facebook page when you're logged in. So they are targeted adverts. Social engineering attacks, obviously if you disclose too much information on a social network, name, age, email address, home address, mobile number, you could be the victim of uh, identity theft. Uh, and other social engineering attacks. Just telling Stephen, actually, interestingly, I think Twitter, on oh no, their LinkedIn's in a second, so we'll come on to that in a second. So Twitter, links to malicious websites. Obviously, if you're following a topic or a person, and they seemingly post a link to a bigger detailed blog or a bigger detailed piece, you might be tempted to click it. Should we be actually clicking unknown URLs? Twitter cut scam, again I think that was probably like 10, 12 months or so ago, maybe a little bit before. And again, social engineering attacks. It's only 140 characters, but people can actually start divulging and disclosing all manner of information about themselves. LinkedIn introductions, I've already mentioned one particular recruiter in the southwest, uh, and, and recruitment agency targeting. Um, at work at Bon Pierce, we've recently ran a social engineering exercise, which was a USB spear phishing exercise. So we actually paid a company to deliver some USB sticks to users within the organization to see how many of them would just plug in an unknown USB stick and run whatever was on that stick. 50% of our users, of the ones that we targeted, plugged it in and ran. Luckily, all it planted was a single flag file with my name in it saying this has been part of a social engineering exercise, please contact Paul McKay for further details. We also set up um, a bogus email which I received all of the emails to to see how many people, because we sent them a letter with this USB stick, um, to see how many people would email the address to say my details aren't on this stick, you've made a mistake, etc., etc. Um, a couple of them did, interestingly. And it was a bombpierce.com email address. However, the letters were received through the recorded delivery, which should have raised alarm bells straight away. The letter that was printed by the external company, they'd never actually seen our letter template, but they managed to retrieve a copy of our letter template off the internet through four or five different sources, none of which were actually the Bomb Pierce site. And they went to the, the trouble of actually branding the USB sticks with the Bomb Pierce logo, which is why I think the majority, or 50% of our users, plugged it in, rightly or wrongly, soon to be slapped wrists all around. <laughs> Blogs, again, if you disclose too much information, it can lead to social engineering attacks. Hijack blogs, this links to malicious sites, so again, links that are embedded into the blogs or at the end of blogs for further details, etc., or related topics, might not necessarily be a related topic. It might actually lead to a hijacked site, malicious code comes down, infected computer. Reputation can come into question, especially if you've got a disgruntled employee. 
uh, and all that disgruntled employee wants to do is sit there and say, I work for X, Y, and Z, and they're rubbish. Going to do brand and reputation of that business no good whatsoever. And not all blogs are good. Some of you might have seen that particular screen in the last six to twelve months, I guess. That's actually a scareware malware. The said company that actually run that site are actually wanting you to click on remove all. It certainly does look like a genuine Microsoft security or Windows security alert. However, it's actually embedded into a web page rather than the actual My Computer page that you would normally see. Looks very convincing. At first, did catch quite a few people. Like, what that actually does is downloads a Trojan. In fact, it downloads a worm. And it starts encrypting certain areas of your hard drive. And then they want extortion amounts of money in order to give you the decryption keys in order to make your machine work again. Quite sneaky. Didn't think of it first. Risks of using the internet in general. The internet is a powerful tool. Massively powerful. Propagation of information can be within minutes, which aids marketing, aids the business to reach out to everybody that they want to reach out to. It's always on. Never goes off. Certainly in Google. Always present, never deleted with the Google cache. So Google's privacy policy, which we'll come on to in a second. And there are thousands of new sites daily. Again, some are good, vast majority are bad. IPv4 has run out. Okay, so ISPs and all of these new websites are generally going to be targeted against IPv6. I think IPv4 ran out in February of this year. So, a while ago, actually. So, successes of Web 2.0. Hopefully you can make out what that is. That's actually a, a map picture from Universal Studios' Wizarding World of Harry Potter. So, Universal Studios in Orlando. Cindy Gordon, who's the Vice President for Marketing. She basically had an unlimited budget to market the new Wizarding World of Harry Potter. She could have planted adverts on the TV in the middle of the Super Bowl, arguably one of the biggest sporting events watched. Blimps, obviously the Americans are big on advertising on their big blimps and so on and so forth. She didn't do any of that. What she did is she found out the world's seven most popular bloggers and she invited them to a secret midnight webinar she basically told them the details and the information about the Wizarding World of Harry Potter. Sure enough, those seven people, after the midnight session, went away and they blogged about what they had been told by Cindy, uh, Cindy Gordon. And sure enough, within 24 hours, it had gone viral. It had gone absolutely around the world in 24 hours. That's how powerful the internet and the right style of blog that captivates people to read it can be used. Another instance, Dr. Helen Smith, she's a dentist in Boston. Business, £150,000 a year. She was in the local directory along with you know, a handful or so other dentists and a bit like the UK unless you're prepared to call your company a silly name of A1 or 1111A or some other random name so you appear first, then, you know, people might not actually get to your advert. However, what she did, she wrote a blog and a book entitled Healthy Mouth, Healthy Sex. Patients loved it. The American Association hated it because of what she was trying to portray uh, dental hygiene, etc., to be. Within two years, her business went from £150,000 a year to be in excess of a mil uh, $1 million uh, per year. So again, by blogging, by writing a book, 
captivated people. She's uh, been able to turn her business from a probably just getting by business to a thriving business. So, with the successes, and for every success, there's probably ten gaffes, at least. So, Member of Parliament Warren Swain sacked after a racial comment about MP uh, Chukka Amuna. And I think that was via Twitter. There was also another instance of a, an MP up in uh, Cumbria somewhere who was stood in the, the queue of a post office and he tweeted something. And that also got him pretty much out the door very, very quickly. Disclosure of information when accounts have been hacked. So if you've got weak passwords, people can actually start using that again to disclose information. Workers sat the calling job boring on Facebook. Again, said person probably listed where they worked, and as such, detrimental to the business brand and reputation, and got sacked. July 2009, Darren Bent in Tottenham berated his boss, Daniel Levy, costing him a fine of £80,000. Okay, so, cost implication there. Tim Bresnan, England cricket all around there hit the expletive button and replied to comments about his weight and he later apologised. There was some stuff in the, the press about him ballooning and becoming fat, etc. And he basically went off on a bit of a rant. A bit like Joey Barton does these days, if you think of uh, footballers. He seems to be quite a, an avid tw tweeter. And the gaffes continue. So two successes and already six gaffes. Philip Hughes, Australian cricketer, Revealed he had been dropped prior to the England test, which basically gave England cricket team a psychological edge because they knew that he wouldn't be playing. So they knew that he wouldn't be playing, so that it wouldn't be his style of cricket being played. An employee sacked on Facebook, another one on Facebook, after complaining about her pervy boss, forgetting that they were friends on Facebook. <laughs> At least go and check first. So, posted a comment, complaining, and the boss left, as you can see, a war message, basically saying, don't come in tomorrow. He's sacked. Recent issues, certainly the London riots, very much orchestrated with the use of social media. So, Twitter, um, I think Twitter was the main one, and Facebook. No press about the London rights being orchestrated or controlled via LinkedIn, as an example. Protection, then. So, isolate the user actions and machine, so defence in depth and least privilege. To ensure that your users in your business or within your environment only have as much rights and permissions on your system as they need in order to do their job, and no more. Difficult to do at times. People move jobs. This is where we get something called permission creep. So, a person might work in the accounts department and then say, I've had enough of this, and they go and work somewhere else, and all of a sudden they've still got access to all of the accounts information. Educate users to best practices and provide security booklets for them to take home. Again, not the most interesting of topics, but will help your business. Provide acceptable usage guidelines. This is the one in work at the moment. I'm battling with our business development department around the use of social networking and social media. They're very much that all of our users should be allowed to use Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, etc., etc. Because all they can see is the positive side of it. I can see the positives, but I can also see the risks. And test users periodically, whether it be via social engineering exercises, Random subset of users don't always pick on the same users. They're going to get pretty savvy to the fact that every six months you might come along and try and catch them out. You're not actually trying to catch them out, you're trying to raise awareness. It's quite an important thing to, to, to mention as well. And to publish the results internally. <laughs> but whatever you do, don't publish them externally. <laughs> Very big brand and reputational base um, faux pas that would be. 
So going back to Google and the Google privacy policy, Google's cookies do not expire until 2038, according to their own privacy policy. Google will start issuing users cookies that will be set to auto-expire after two years, while auto-renewing the cookies of active users during this time period. So what does that actually mean? That means that if you go to Google or use any of Google services, whether it be Gmail, Google Search, Google Plus, Virgin Media's search bar, I think, is these days powered by Google, as are a whole myriad of other web providers. If you use any of those, a cookie will get created, and that will stay on the Google service for two years. As long as you cease to use any of Google services. If you continue to use Google Mail, Gmail, Google Search, that cookie auto-renews for a period of two years, every time you use it. So again, the two year period restarts every time you use a Google service. Google Chrome is an interesting one, which is obviously Google's browser. <coughs> Quite a few people like to use it these days, it's a lot lighter than IE, seems to work a lot quicker than Internet Explorer. Dangers, Google knows every URL you searched without clicking submit. You, most of you would have probably noticed whenever you use Google now, whether it's via Internet Explorer, Safari, Firefox, whatever, the moment you start typing your search out, you no longer have to click submit. You already start getting results. And the way they do that is because they monitor what you actually type. So they know what you've typed before you've hit submit. It's quite scary. And Google tracks every auto suggestion, so that is that express search pop up. The future of web applications then, so pre web, newspapers mainly. Then the web came along, and then a handful of years or so ago, web 2.0 came along. Smartphones, iPhones, HTCs, Google devices, Android all capable of running web 2.0 device, allow you to interact with others, Facebook, LinkedIn, etc. Web 3.0, which many people probably haven't heard, is coming, uh, and certainly you can see from the, the little icon, um, where's the mouse, uh, this icon here, some of you might actually recognise, that's the um, check-in place on Facebook. So that's using what's deemed to be Web 3.0. So no longer is it just allowing you to interact, it's actually tracking your movements as well. Big Brother, eat your heart out. So in summary then, neither you nor your clients or staff own social data. Google, Facebook, Twitter, Bebo, MySpace, they own data. The data is actually held on their server. It's theirs. A flaw in any of Google's or Facebook or any other third party application can expose consumer data to disclosure of information very easily. Don't forget that once it's on the internet, it's on the internet. This sets the stage for ID theft, insurance theft, employment denials, which I've seen quite a lot utilised recently actually where a company will do a recruitment campaign and all of the applications that they get in, somebody will sit there and actually go through Facebook or go through Twitter or go through MySpace to see if that person's on there to find out what sort of person that person is before they've even come for an interview. As well as any psychometric testing and other pre-assessment days and so on and so forth that, that Bon Pierce do. Most privacy policies have loopholes that you could basically drive a battleship through. That's one of the things that our business development department aren't quite so keen on trying to readjust. 
they're happy to adjust the internet usage policy to say you can use Facebook, but that's it. <laughs> they don't want to touch any other policy around disciplinary procedure or through privacy policies. It's important to encrypt, encrypt, encrypt. Whether it be full hard drive encryption for your laptop users, whether it be file and folder encryption for your normal users. Any sensitive data you need to protect. And basically plan on having a breach and then dealing with the fallout of that breach. It's pretty much guaranteed that if you use social media and you use the web in order to promote your business, you will at some point have a form of breach. Whether it be a company sending branded USB sticks through the post and recorded delivery to your users, who 50% of them then go and plug them in and run the executable. That technically is a breach. Those, that 50% did not deal with the USB stick in the way that they should have. Users treat their computers like cars. They assume there's a le lemon law for, the, for software or a seatbelt protecting them from themselves. I would imagine all of you in this room that can drive, the first thing that you do when you get in your car, or pretty much the first thing, is put your seatbelt on. Businesses and companies are very much of the attitude of it's never happened to me or us, so it never will. Well, the analogy there with the seatbelt is I always put my seatbelt on in the car. I've never been thrown through my windscreen either. Never been close to being thrown through my windscreen, but I still put my seatbelt on. People like new technology and new tools, especially in law firms. Partners, they like new gadgets. They like Blackberries, they banging on about iPhones and various other devices. Uh, so suggestions to take away with you. Educate yourself through seminars, discussions, uh, web training. Educate your users. Don't lecture them. Try and educate them and make them aware that it's a, an awareness session and that you're not trying to be a dictator, although in most cases you are, of what they can and cannot do. Educate your families and especially the kids, especially if you work from home and if you've got a corporate laptop that you use, obviously that should be very much for your corporate use, not for allowing your little kitty to go on CBBS or Facebook or whatever else. Analyse trends and pay attention to regulatory changes and legal opinions. Obviously being a law firm, uh, the Law Society or the Solicitors Regulatory Authority actually changed their guidelines for law firms in the UK last Thursday, the 6th of October. Uh, massive set of changes, uh, which a lot of people at Bond Pierce are actually chomping at the bit and running around like headless chickens in order to get those changes implemented. Keep on top of emerging threats. Read blogs, the good ones. Stay current with your um, antivirus definition pattern files. Uh, and try and keep ahead of the game. Very difficult to do. Perform in-depth information flow analysis and information leakage analysis. So verify the information that your users are putting on Twitter. Verify the information that your users business development department, marketing department, are putting onto your public facing website. Are there any questions at all? Or have you all gone to sleep? <laughs>